This week, we'll take apart the word Elohim. We ask the question, where does it come from? Could it have hidden meanings? And how does it possibly connect to ideas of leadership? Then we hear the exciting and bizarre conclusion to William Wirt, the first anti-Masonic party nominee. What would you do if you got a phone call asking you if you wanted William Wirt's head? We follow it up with some great perspectives from Brother Thomas Williams on his new piece, Redefining the Three Great Pillars. What other meanings could you assign to these pillars? Lastly, we'll wrap it up with some psychology, hacking the human brain. Freemasonry's been doing it a long time. All this and more. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Welcome back to the show. This is episode number 466. First and foremost, I want to thank all of our producers, the supporters of this show. Whether you're a producer, a fellow, or a contributor, every little bit helps. I want to thank you all for all of your assistance over the weeks, months, and days. Putting this together is no small endeavor, and every little bit helps us bring continued improvement of content all the time. If you want to learn more about how you can support the WCY Podcast, your source for Masonic education, head on over to WCYPodcast.com and click on Support the Show to learn more. What is going on in the news? The first thing I'd like to mention is that over the last week or so, we launched a GoFundMe for $3 million. That's right. This is not $3 million for the Whence Came You podcast. However, what it is, is a fundraiser for Masonic Retreat and Higher Learning. The $3 million is to acquire and renovate a two-acre property in the Denver suburbs right outside of Littleton, Colorado, for our new Masonic Retreat and Center for Higher Learning. I know this sounds crazy, you guys, but think about this. We're going to offer Masonic Retreats and Lectures, a location for members of the Masonic Fraternity and their families, as well as interested members of the public to assemble and participate in lectures and events. Additionally, the location is going to be the headquarters for Wilmshurst University, the hub of our online learning for Masons interested in exploring history, philosophy, and the esoteric transmissions of the Western mystery tradition. For anybody interested in what that might be, head on over to www.wilmshurstuniversity.com. This was a concept that we could offer amazing collegiate courses on things related to Freemasonry. And it was just kind of a passing conversation. And one day I got a wild, crazy idea to just put up a concept website. I said to myself, what would it look like if we had a website? And so what I did was I bought a .com and I put up just a simple one pager as a, again, proof of concept. And it was shared around I didn't share it. Uh, Brother Ben shared it, and it got a lot of attention. And uh, to those people out there who got on the website and just got super excited and sent me an email right away, when do I sign up? When can I sign up for coursework? And I had to say, you can't yet. It's just a concept. And Ben and I talked about getting a Masonic kind of retreat center, and then it all kind of gelled together. And so we're asking for your support. Three million bucks is a lot of money, we know. However, if everybody gives a little bit, maybe it's not so bad. Ben and I have both donated. We have lots of people who have already donated. And um, the nice thing about GoFundMe is is if we don't meet the goal, it all gets refunded. So it doesn't matter. (laughs) You're not going to lose money. It's not like a Kickstarter. But if we can do it, we can do it. And I know it's ambitious and wild and crazy, and you're probably thinking you're nuts. This is insane. Maybe not. What if? There's only one way to find out, and that's if we try. So we're going to try. If you want to know more, again, you can head on over to WCYpodcast.com and you can click on more or side projects there and you'll see a little link for Wilmshurst University. And you can check out kind of the coursework and what I'm thinking, what Ben and I are looking at doing. And um, I'll also put a link to our GoFundMe on that website as well. Thanks for letting me tell you about this. 
uh, ambitious idea. Please check it out and consider it. Next up is the fact that we just had Grand Lodge sessions via the web uh, for the Grand Lodge of Illinois. We had a really great time. It was super weird that we accomplished in two hour, two and a half hours what normally takes us two days. There was no legislation brought before Grand Lodge, so you know we saved quite a bit of time there, and there wasn't like the introductions and all of these things. So it was really bare bones, and I really commend the Grand Lodge of Illinois for a job well done. A job well done indeed. I continue to serve the uh, Grand Lodge of Illinois on the Education Committee, so I've been reappointed to that. And uh, wildly enough, my best friend Scott is has stepped down from the state education officer post to pursue his educational career and family goals. I want to just say a million thank yous to, uh, to Scott Duball for his service to the Illinois Grand Lodge in terms of education, because without him, we really wouldn't have established a meaningful education experience. Uh, he set the bar, and I think we're really going to try to follow it. And of course, the exciting news is that who else could fill the state education office? And when I tell you who it is, maybe you'll be surprised. It's not some Joe Schmo you might never have heard of. It's brother Todd E. Creason. Todd E. Creason has accepted to be the state education officer for the Grand Lodge of Illinois. And so I'll be working uh, once again with uh, illustrious brother Todd. I work for Todd as the uh, co-managing editor now with uh, Darren Laners underneath Todd Creason. So we're going to be continuing this working relationship on into the future to bring more great education to the uh, constituents of the Grand Lodge of the state of Illinois. And to that end, we just wrapped also the Illinois Lodge of Research's latest meeting. I want to thank a lot of the listeners to this podcast because we had guys who hopped on the Illinois Lodge of Research annual meeting from around the globe. It was pretty rad. And I want to thank you guys all for hopping on. And, uh, you know, we actually got a couple petitions out of this. It was really cool. It's not an expensive endeavor. However, it is a, a really fun thing to be a part of considering the fact that it is research based. We were able to give three new people active status in the Lodge of Research. That are Those are people who have uh, submitted at least three papers and, or three presentations. And we were also able to give one fellow to a, a new brother. So congrats to all of those fellows. This is what it's all about, you guys, celebrating Masonic education. It's a big deal. So this week, you, you heard in the opening that we have some great papers and now that I've taken up all this time telling you about news, some things that have been going on in my world and the world of Illinois masonry, let's get into the education because, of course, this show is not just about Illinois masonry. It is about Freemasonry in general and the education that goes along with it. So the first piece I wanted to read is actually a two-part series that comes from the Philosophical Research Society. It was put up in two parts starting in July of 2019. And this first part is called The Elohim, Part 1, The Sons of God. The term Elohim has been alternatively identified as a name of God, angels, demons, or other types of supernatural beings. It has been associated with the Shining Ones, the Anunnaki, Nephilim, and the Watchers. So what is more likely the case? And what are the implications for humanity? The word Elohim is usually thought of as a name for God in the Hebrew Bible, appearing over 2,500 times in that text. The context in which the word is used makes that assertion less clear. However, for some instances, Elohim appears to refer to multiple gods. A look into the word's origins may help determine its meanings. The word's etymology often sheds some light on its original meaning, but in this case, Elohim's roots are somewhat obscure. The online etymology dictionary indicates the word as a plural of Elo, which means God. The entry also states, the word is of unknown etymology and may be an augmentation of El, also meaning God. Examining the word's Hebrew spellings, may also provide some indication of its root, read from right to left as 
Aleph, Lamed, He, Yod, Mem. Hebrew characters when forming a word often tell a story as each character has its own set of meanings. In this case, the Hebrew word Elohim could be interpreted in two ways. In the first interpretation, the first character Aleph can be read as the existence of God's hidden mysteries and their revelation to certain men. Continuing on, there are those who teach men God's mysteries, who are then the same individuals, examples being the Elohim, who goad men into what he needs to learn, encouraging man's action forward. As those men learn God's mysteries, his knowledge comes into those men's hearts. Spirit is breathed into him. As man becomes more spiritual, they become humbler and they become the word over time. Through this learning, one result is that wisdom springs forth from your speech. A second possible interpretation stems from the viewpoint of the Elohim as intermediaries or emissaries of God. The Vev represents the link the Elohim represent between God and man, heaven and earth. The Elohim also enable the spiritual to be made actual in the physical world. They are also the connection between the physical and the spiritual. From the prior, the Elohim provide opportunities for man to choose to open the door and access God directly. Research indicates some possible associations with the second interpretation, but the connections are tenuous at best. The Sumerians, circa 4,500 to 1,900 BCE, believed in a divine race of beings named the Anunnaki, based on imprecise translations of a small subset of some 22,000 hieroglyphic tablets. The interpretations vary from source to source. Some identify the Anunnaki as a pantheon of high-level gods, while others relegate them to a much lower status, having been banished to the underworld by younger and stronger gods. From the Oxford Companion to World Mythology, the Anunnaki, quote, are the Sumerian deities of the old primordial line. They are Chthonic in, under, or beneath the earth, deities of fertility, associated eventually with the underworld, where they become judges, over the question of life and death. In some sources, the Anunnaki are a diffuse, set of natural gods associated with various aspects found throughout nature, while others indicate a specific number of Anunnaki with specific roles, even kings. One unique line of thought comes from Zechariah Sitchin in his 1972 book, The Twelfth Planet. In that book, Sitchin proposes that the Anunnaki are of alien origin and used genetic engineering to create man. In the Bible, it's directly translated as sons of God and are associated with the Anunnaki in Genesis 6-4. Quote, After that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. End quote. Other potential variations include the Shining Ones, referenced in The Hidden Doctrine, authored by Helena Blavatsky. Quote, Behold him lifting the veil and unfurling it from east to west, he shuts out the above and leaves the below to be seen as the great illusion. He marks the places for the shining ones and turns the upper into a shoreless sea of fire. Part 1, Cosmic Evolution, stanza 3. Quote, These are the threefold, the fourfold downward, the mind born, sons of the first lord of the shining seven. Stanza 7 to be continued. Now when I first read this piece, I immediately had to jump to part two, which I thought was also very good. And so before we get to any commentary, let's just jump right into part two. The Elohim, part two, A Crooked Path, August 2019. In the first section of this article, I introduced the term Elohim and examined a variety of potential explanations for the esoteric and etymological meaning of the word. Their possible connections to the Anunnaki and Shining Ones were explored. As discussed in Part 1, the word Elohim is used ubiquitously throughout the Bible. Depending on the context, the word can mean several different things. The most common interpretation is as another general term for God, such as is found in Exodus 12.12. 12. 
A more specific reference is found in 1 Kings 11.33. In 1 Samuel 28.13, the reference is to a supernatural being, or beings, called up at the request of King Saul. In Exodus 4.16, Elohim refers to kings and prophets. As outlined in his article, Meaning, Origin, and Etymology of the Name of Elohim by Abu Nasim el Larmura, states that the term used for God goes through three stages. In the first stage, he is referred to as Elohim, Genesis 1-1 through 2-4. In the second stage, he is referred to as Yahweh Elohim, or Y-H-W-H, Elohim, Genesis 2-4 and onward. Finally, God is referred to as Debar, Y-H-W-H, as in Debar Yahweh during the Noah period. As research topics go, this one is a bit unusual for me, as the other sources for information in this article are somewhat specious, requiring a bit of an imagination stretch on the part of the reader. However, I also found that during my research that several thought trails emerged, and the same kind of thing occurred when this topic was presented during a recent Masonic Philosophical Society meeting. Progression of Influence Direct to Indirect One line of thought is the way religious history unfolded. In earlier days, religious deities appeared to perform a much more prominent role in their interactions with man. As history progresses, however, God's role becomes less discernible and his hand is harder to see, possibly indicating that his influence becomes more indirect in nature. Along the same lines, I thought of how our own education proceeds. In our early days as, say, a kindergartner, the teacher's role is very direct and hands-on. The teacher is close by and visible at all times. As we progress through schooling, the teacher's role becomes less obvious until we get into college where our success or failure is almost exclusively dependent upon our own devices. We enter the workforce with our education in our quiver and make our ways through those mazes adding to our knowledge completely through our own efforts. Finally, in our twilight years, we can take on the role of a teacher ourselves, imparting that which we have learned through the years. Path of evolution, dominance to peace. A second thought that occurred to me is related to man's perception of God over the centuries. Early on in his history, man was more aggressive and heavily dependent upon the brawn for dominance. Similarly, his views if the gods were warlike as well. Think about the many stories of the gods from the Greek pantheon, how they seem to constantly be pit against one another, as well as man. As man matured, his belligerent tendencies began to soften. Though far from perfect, man is on an improved path, and his views of God evolved similarly. Today, God is seen as the embodiment of peace and goodwill. An interesting contrast presents itself today among people of differing warlike stances. Terrorists tend to view their God as very direct and confrontational, similar to themselves, whereas those in the Western world tend to view God from a Christian point of view as a primary peacemaker. Using the same logic, it is my belief that those we named fallen angels may not be what we think them to be. Rather, it is possible that those devils, quote unquote, may have a specific role to play in man's existence and evolution, one that forms in opposition to the good angels that is very deliberate. Could their purpose have been to propel humanity's evolution by forcing man to recognize and be challenged by his opposite, evolving leadership? authoritarian to authentic. The general type of leadership most often practiced by the mainstream evolved along comparable lines. In early days, leadership was much more direct and unambiguous. The leader was very evident and authoritarian in nature. He maintained his power through force, if necessary, and it was often the strongest that assumed kingship and other positions of authority. Today, more indirect and subtle forms of leadership are championed. Some examples, including servant leadership and authentic leadership, require the practitioner to embody traits like humility and to learn to read emotions. Overall, I found this research subject to be very satisfying, rewarding, and somewhat surprising. I learned that no line of research should be discounted, however unlikely the topic, 
And that an unusual topic can lead you down crooked paths to reach unexpected conclusions. And that is the end of this uh, two-part series. I liked the adventure, the crooked paths that this particular blogger wrote about what started as a historical and accurate account of the etymology or the origin of the word Elohim brought us through history and ended as we talked about eventually a revelation had by the student about the aggressive or passive versions of deity and ultimately into an area of even leadership which is really interesting in and of itself especially considering the sweeping wave of servant leadership that has taken the helm especially within Freemasonry we now see more empowerment and less authoritarian modes of leadership so i hope you enjoyed that two part series right now we're going to get into the second part of illustrious brother harrison's awesome piece that we started last week about william wirt and the anti masonic party i told you all that if he sent it i would put it on and darn it i meant what i said so let's have a listen and see what we can learn William Wirt, a man who was a Freemason, yet not only ran for president on the anti-Masonic ticket, he also defended the fraternity in his nominating speech. But Wirt's strange and mystifying actions don't tell his full story. Years after his death, the tale of William Wirt becomes downright bizarre. In December, 2003, the phone rang in the office of William Feck, manager of Washington's Congressional Cemetery. Feck answered and an unidentified voice asked, would you be interested in getting William Wirt's head back? The man, who has never been identified, explained he was in possession of articles a collector had accumulated over the years. The caller claimed Wirt's family tomb was robbed in the mid-1980s, and that is how he came in possession of the skull. The man called a few more times, but never produced the skull. In the meantime, Feck had Wirt's tomb inspected, found the contents to be in disarray, and concluded it had been robbed. A month later, Feck received his second mysterious inquiry about the skull with the caller asking a question he had heard before. Are you missing William Wirt's head? This time the caller identified himself as DC Council Member Jim Graham, who said he had Wirt's skull in his office. Or at least he said, I have a skull in an old metal box painted with gold letters reading the Honorable William Wirt. Apparently, the anonymous caller had contacted Graham and told him the cemetery might be interested in getting it back or at least determining if it really was Wirt's skull. It took the cemetery's plotting bureaucracy over a year to investigate, but in May 2005, a task force again opened the tomb and inspected the bodies inside. A thorough scientific study eventually determined the skull was in fact that of William Wirt. Graham revealed the names of the man who had given him the skull and the collector, but it was never determined who robbed the tomb or who the original anonymous caller was. Adding to the mystery, the task force discovered the remains of an infant inside the tomb and determined they were placed in there after the 1980s break-in. No one knows the identity of the infant, who put it there, or why. In the very unlikely event he would have been elected president, Wirt would have died in office two years later at the age of 61. The Freemason who ran for president 
on the anti-Masonic ticket, but defended Freemason, leaves us with unanswered questions nearly two centuries after his death. But with his skull now returned to its rightful place, he now rests in peace while the rest of us ponder the enigma that was William Wirt. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Somebody had William Wirt's skull. I was fully prepared for Steve Harrison to say, a thorough scientific evaluation concluded that it was not the skull, but that isn't what he said. Pretty amazing history, once again, stranger than fiction. You know, growing up, I used to get the Scholastic Book Fair little newspapers, and I would always order these really bizarre books, you know, the history of Atlantis or uh, Egyptian myths or I remember one set of books I had that was called Stranger Than Fiction and Stranger Than Fiction 2. And this just belongs right up there with it. It's just wild and crazy stuff, of course, in the realm of Masonic history, no less. I want to thank illustrious brother Harrison for sending me the file early. He, I think he heard what I said and he sent it and he said, it's up to you if you want to run it or not. <laughs> Yeah, but I couldn't wait, and um, I thought it was a really great piece, and I couldn't wait to share it with all of you. If you are curious about illustrious Brother Harrison and his videos and his works, please check out his YouTube channel, One Minute Mason, as well. You can check out the WCY podcast with the Whence Came You YouTube channel. Like and subscribe our videos there. If you subscribe, you're always going to get the episodes of the show there as well as the independent videos that illustrious Brother Harrison puts together for us, uh, and we upload those there also. Uh, if you see Brother Harrison anywhere, tell him thanks. He is just one of my Masonic heroes, and I know a lot of you say the same thing. You know, whenever you read his articles, you read his articles in his voice. I do too. Check out his books in the bookstore. We have links to all of his books that he's edited and written in our Amazon link, linked shop. Now, before I move on one more time, I wanted to let you all know about the Great Books program. I try to let you guys know every single time that enrollment is opening up. So currently, right now, enrollment is full. However, on October 12th, which if you're listening to this on Sunday, it's on Monday, they will open up and they will only accept 200 new people. So they'll have 200 spots available for seven days. You're going to want to head on over to wcypodcast.com, click on our friends at the top, click on the Great Books program, and click on that link right there. You'll get 25% off if you use the promo code WCY. That 25% off is good for your first three months of the program, which is a really steep discount. Brother Scott Hambrick, who runs this program, does us a solid. If you're into this stuff, reading classic books by authors like Homer, Nietzsche, Cicero, Spinoza, and more, you have to check this out. It's a really great program, and it helps us all in our cognitive thinking and processing rational thought and all of these things. So next, I have a piece that was sent to me by Brother Thomas J. Williams who's a Midnight Freemason guest contributor, and he sent a paper called Redefining the Three Great Pillars, and I'd like to read that for you now. As an entered apprentice, we learn that a lodge's supports are the three great pillars, wisdom, strength, and beauty. The lecture states, quote, wisdom, strength, and beauty are said to support a lodge because it is necessary. There should be wisdom to contrive, strength to support, and beauty to adorn all great and important undertakings. While I agree these are the lodge supports, what if we were to redefine and give the pillars further meaning? A reflection of my time in the craft, traveling experiences, and exploring more light on my own, I have attributed other things to these three pillars to support a lodge. Education, fellowship, and ritual. Education. We should always be in pursuit of more light in masonry. Over and over again, 
I've seen lodges confer degrees and continue business without spending a bit of time sharing knowledge amongst the brethren. If we're a fraternity that is taking good men and making them better, how is this happening? It doesn't need to be rigid like a college course. It should be fun and beneficial. Listening to a podcast episode, reading a paper related to a Masonic topic, or just gathering to have a free-flowing discussion about thoughts behind our symbols and ceremonies can invigorate a lodge. This is an opportunity to reach out to our brothers we haven't seen in a while and keep the new brothers who are eager to learn more. Education should never be discounted. Fellowship. We are the world's oldest fraternity connecting men of different backgrounds and cultures. Whether inside or outside of a lodge, there should be an opportunity to build and expand these connections. I don't know about you, but I didn't join to only confer degrees, read minutes, and pay bills. I want to feel genuine relationships built with men around me and the community we live in. Fellowship can take different forms, going out to a pub with brothers and their families, an intellectual evening exploring the esoteric concepts of the world, rehearsing for degrees, and participating in community events. There are plenty of ways to get the ball rolling. At the end of the day, one should feel comfortable enough to approach someone else without anxiety about how the conversation may go because there's little relationship there. Ritual. The ceremonies to bring candidates into the craft are beautiful. We should strive to provide the best to our new brothers. While word-for-word -word presentation of the ritual are great, it's not about reciting a novel to the new initiate. There should be meaning behind the presentation, bringing it back to education. It's also essential to understand the ritual and not recite it. While these are just my own musings on supports of a lodge, I think an honest reflection of these three areas within your lodge may prompt a discussion on how to adjust how things have always been done to how things could be to make the Masonic experience better. Submitted Thomas T.J. Williams. Brother Thomas, thank you so much for the submission to the Midnight Freemasons. I hope you don't mind that I read it on the show. I, I found it to be inspiring. I think that inspiration will get carried across to many more people who either hadn't read the website or are familiar with it. And last piece for this week is a piece that I wrote called Don't Fake It Until You Make It. Don't Fake It Until You Make It. By Midnight Freemason contributor Robert H. Johnson. Recently, I was asked to watch a video for school. It was a 20-minute TED Talk featuring Dr. Amy Cutter. Her specialty? Nonverbal body mechanics and their effect on others and ourselves. There was a lot in her talk in regards to what our body language tells others. However, that wasn't what this talk was about. Her team of experts asked a question. Does our body language have an effect on our own minds? In short, the answer is yes. For instance, holding a pencil in your mouth imitates a smiling face. The mere use of these muscles in this way for two minutes floods the brain with chemicals that elicit happy feelings. Yep, want to feel happy? Hold a pencil in your mouth for two minutes. But more importantly, they found that certain power poses, like sitting openly, upright, and bold for periods of just two minutes resulted in a 20% increase in testosterone and a 25% decrease in cortisol. This means more control and less stress, a critical psychological factor in the world's top leaders of companies. All this was certainly interesting, but what caught my eye or ear more than anything else was her message about practicing these things to give yourself a confident edge. For instance, before a job interview, most people sit hunched over and staring at their phones. This is the opposite of a power pose and leads to reduced testosterone and an increase in cortisol. This puts you in a place that gives you a significant less of an edge in your interview. If we practice these quote unquote power poses, these small tricks, there could be significant changes to your psyche and the result could mean a more successful life. How does this relate to the craft? Well, indeed, you could put this into practice and leadership. But more than that, Dr. Cuddy's message was that you don't have to fake it until you make it. You can instead fake it until you become it. Let me explain. For her studies, they attempted to get people with low self-esteem to change it by trying these power poses. 
but not to just temporarily increase the self-esteem, to fake it for the current situation, a permanent change, a life-changing one. In Freemasonry, we consistently remind ourselves of the virtues and values we hold dear. Prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, faith, hope, charity. Even if we aren't great at practicing these virtues, talking about them, pretending we're good at them, over time, might result in the effect we're looking for. As we consistently expose ourselves to these tenets, we necessarily change the way our behaviors are exhibited. We talk more about prudent action, we become more circumspect in our decision making. If we converse about justice, our thoughts and actions become more equitable to our fellows. If we speak of temperance often enough, we might avoid that extra drink at the office party. If we keep the idea of fortitude in our minds, we begin to overcome adversity and stand for the right things. To sum all this up, it seems like what Dr. Cuddy offers to the profane world is something we've been doing a long time. I do like her twist on the saying, fake it until you become it, because it gives us hope that we will, in fact, become better people. Finally, I wish to direct anyone who wishes to view her TED Talk to do so, and also anyone who thinks they've made the transition already to read illustrious Brother Brian Pettis' latest work. As for me, I'm still working on it. Signed, a big old faker. That's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed. We'll be back next week with some all new content. As always, I want to thank our contributors, our fellows, our producers one last time before we leave you for the week. And uh, take care, everybody. We'll talk to you all next week. Until then, stay on the level. For Wentz you, I'm Robert Johnson. been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition.